Hey guys, it's uh, Kate420, and uh, today I'm bringing you a case that has had me wrapped up for weeks. Um, I'm a person that likes to you know, do my research uh, and, and get the video out and get their voice heard as soon as possible. This is as soon as I could get this out because I have been literally neck deep in this case. This started out with the sub asking me to look into someone um, that they knew. And that would be this girl right here, victim right here, Megan Waterman. And that's, I couldn't, I couldn't just look into Megan because Megan's story can't be told unless we talk about these other girls, unless their names and their stories are told as well. So I had to get to know each of their stories. I had to get to know each and every one of their um, days leading up to their going missing. And I think that you'll enjoy uh, learning about this video or learning about this case, but at the same time, prepare to get caught up. Prepare to want to dig deeper because Everything and anything that could have happened to the fam the poor victims, you know, families in this case has, has, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like a nightmare for these families that's happened. So um, without further ado, let's get on with it. Okay, our story starts with Shannon Gilbert. Shannon Gilbert was originally um, reported missing. Um, I, I want to say it was May 1st, but let's get to that because there's a whole story behind all this. Um, Shannon Gilbert was just a bright-eyed social butterfly that had big, big dreams. Shannon wanted to be a famous singer, and straight out of high school, she had no fears of moving to New York City and following that dream, um, which she did. There was nothing her mother could do to stop her because she was an adult and legal and basically... Um, nothing that could be said could stop Shannon from wanting to go to New York where all stars, you know, uh, have their start. Uh, so, excuse me. Um, she was last seen on May 1st, 2010. What happened between the time Shannon moved to New York to be a singer and May 1st, 2010? Was it what happened to a lot of girls? In Shannon's very situation in many big cities in many small urban areas wherever all over the United States this is, it, it, all over the world this seems to be happening when women um, either feel like they have no other choice or or are in a position where they have to pay the bills so a lot of them uh, would resort to their bodies the problem with the story is because that was their, their profession at the time, and because the families were honest with the police about it, it would be the reason why many of these girls' missing persons cases were not taken seriously and maybe the reason why they weren't found soon enough. So... Shannon Gilbert, on the night of May 1st, 2005, right now, excuse me, 2010, her driver, Michael Pack, she had a driver that would take her to her jobs. She got a phone call from a man um, named Joseph Brewer in Oak Beach, um, and he wanted... It, to, you know, Shannon to come over for a date, what whatnot. And so Michael Pack, her driver, took her to the date. Um 
about an hour and a half after being inside, there was a 911 call. Shannon was um, apparently upstairs in the house hiding. The 911 call was 22 minutes long. In this 911 call, Shannon tells the operator that they're plotting to kill her. She's you know, terrified, hysterical. Um, she, you know, she's freaking out that they're plotting to kill her. Please help me. And she doesn't know where she is. She feels like she's drugged up, so on and so forth. The, but my whole, I guess my first question when I started, and the very first thing that was through, off to me was a 22 minute phone call to 911. Normally, it doesn't matter if you don't know where you are. At that point, 911 has located you. Even in 2010, that that was available. So that kind of throws me off. You know, it makes me wonder if 911 was taking her serious. Um, on the phone to 911, you can hear um, closer to the end of the call, you can hear her driver, Michael Pack, and you can also hear Joseph Brewer. You cannot make out exactly what's being said. But Joseph Brewer later said he was telling her or telling the, her driver to you know, get her out of his house. Upon him telling her to leave multiple times and my, and and whatnot, somehow Shannon um, ran and made, made it out of the house, um, off the phone with nine one one, and basically was running down this gated community in Oak Beach. Okay, down the road. Um, but that, well, those were not the last people to see Shannon. Shannon ran to a neighbor, Gus Coletti's home at 5 a.m. and knocked on his door. Uh, hysterically, she told him that people were trying to kill her. He had her come in. He had her sit down. He told her to relax. He called 911. He told them the location. Okay. She was there for a few minutes. He told her to just relax. So the police came. She started to freak out. She got up. She ran out of his house. Um, it took over an hour for police to come. And even uh, uh, in between that, Gus happened to see when she ran out of his home, a black SUV followed slowly after her. Now, he at the time did not know that Michael Pack was the driver of that SUV. And that he swears he was just trying to get Shannon in the car to take her home. And that after so long, after she ran off of Gus Coletti's house, that, you know, he couldn't find her. And he ended up looking for her for about another hour and then left. So, um, police came a full hour later. And they did not search for Shannon. And she did tell the 911 operator who the they were that was trying to kill her. And that even though it, that name has never been released, the families were never told. All they were told was that person was given a lie detector test and the results were inconclusive. So I'm not quite sure why that aspect of things has never been looked into uh any further but, but of course nobody that's researching the case could really find that out because you know they're keeping it keeping that information locked up you're going to find that in this in, in the long island serial killer case which is what they call this case um you're going to find obstruction from police department, Suffolk County PD, all the way through. You're going to find the families being treated terribly. You're going to find obstruction. You're going to find the families being left out in the dark for years and years. So just be prepared because this, this story is uh, um, not done, which is why I'm here talking about it. So um, the search for Shannon ignited um you know uh basically the search for shannon gilbert brought about a discovery it was not the discovery of shannon but if it had not been for her search these four young ladies would not have been found
Come on. It always takes a minute when I'm recording, guys. Sorry. All right, well, I tried. I may end up just having to keep going because a lot of times it's weird. I notice a lot of times on this screen recorder thing I have, um, depending on how many tabs I have up, that like videos don't play, which kind of sucks because, but at the same time, it's not a big deal. I can read it. So this is really, like I said, um, what happened is during the search for Shannon, uh, I'll come back to that. Hold on here. There was a discovery of four young ladies. Um, hang on here. Here we go. We talked about this is Shannon's story right here. Um, and then here it is. Okay. The first major discovery took place on December 11, 2010. It was a cold and windy day. Officer John Maleo was out, train, out on a training exercise with his cadaver dog, Blue. Searching for Shannon in a strip of brush just off Ocean Parkway at Gilgo Beach. Six miles west of Oak Beach. Both beaches are located on a string of barrier islands separating the mass of Long Island from the Atlantic Ocean. To the north, across South Oyster Bay, are the Long Island suburbs of Massapequa and Amityville. Farther east are the Waspy Enclaves of the Hamptons. But the stretch along Ocean Parkway is mostly state park, poison ivy choke, scrub brush, marshland, and beaches, with the occasional cluster of homes hugging the shoreline. During the winter, it's practically deserted. Around 3 p.m., Blue caught a scent and led Malaya through a dense thicket into a spot 30 feet from the road. That was what Malaya described. There was what Malaya described as some burlap in most of the skeleton. Returning to the area two days later, Malaya and Blue found three more sets of remains, all of them 30 feet from the road, 500 feet apart, draped in burlap. The following day, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dormer made an announcement. I don't think it's a coincidence that four bodies ended up in this area. We could have a serial killer. Um, and then according to Vernon Garbat, the retired commander of the Bronx Homicide Task Force, he says that um, the, they investigated numerous serial killers and the clustering of victims was strange. Most serial killers don't do that. They spread the remains around. This guy felt so secure at this location, he made this it made it his burial ground. Um, the one thing I want to bring up is that the families of these girls were very upset by the numerous media and newspaper articles and and all the discussions about the teenage or the, the young ladies, um, and not referring to them as just young women taken at the prime of their life but referring to them as escorts or prostitutes, escorts or prostitutes. And because of that, um, it's it's been very hard on the families to, I can't, I can't think about it. Uh, it's very hard on the families to hear the word escort or prostitute be the last thing describing a child that they just lost, that they just found was dead, that they had high hopes was just out there living her life somewhere and, and you know, and, and just wasn't getting a hold of the family. So anyway, 
Um, Shannon had a sister named Sarah. She has two sisters, Sarah and Sh and Sherry. And her mother, Marie, was very vocal um, about, like I said, um, it says Shannon Gilbert was a girl with issues. She bounced around from foster home to foster home and was diagnosed bipolar. But she seemed to have settled into normalcy at high school where she excelled, graduating early at age 16. And then it says... Um, we did all the Shannon stuff. I kind of wanted to, well, I'm going to go back to it. I just want to make sure that we move on to the, the girls that were found and then back to Shannon. Cause Shannon is a, a major part of this case. Um, but again, they each, uh, we'll go. so, Let's start with the. I want to um, address the victims really quick. Um, and oops, and I'm going to do it. And I, I I have something at the end, but I have the map as well. I just want to. I want I want you guys to see their faces, all of them, um, because they all deserve that. Just like in the beginning um, of my of the video when i talk about them I want, I want them to be more than just that so um here we go we'll uh, pull this one up first i'm gonna go okay all right so victim a is or was excuse me the very first girl found is right here melissa bartholomew so let's talk about her first because um she was the first found melissa bartholomew was 23 years old 24 years old she moved to new york city to be a hairdresser and got mixed up in escorting okay um she was last seen um i don't know do they have a i don't think they have a date on her they were I, but i know that the family attempted to make a missing person report and again new york city police were very uh yeah, rude and not serious about looking for her because why because of her title because of what she did for a living not because of you know that she was a 24 year old girl and they have daughters they didn't they didn't think about those things um the thing about melissa bartholomew's case is that melissa had a sister that shortly after um her sister went missing she started receiving, the sister started receiving calls from Melissa's phone. Only it was a man on the other end. As excited as she was and thought it was her sister, the first time she answered it, it was a man on the other end. And that man claimed um, that he had killed her sister and that he knew where she was. He was coming for her and her mother. And just terrible. There was multiple phone calls, and I'm just really not sure how police were not able to use the you know the information collected from the multiple phone calls this guy made to the sister with melissa's phone um i don't know how that couldn't have been used to investigate this further um victim b was amber lynn costello okay she was second found she's 27 years old she had a drug addiction, which, and this is per her roommate, which she escorted to support her addiction. Her roommate said that she left for the date. Uh, he had heard the date person call for a date, and she did something that she never does. She walked out the door, and she left her phone, her purse, everything that would identify her, or whatever. Just, she walked out the door with just herself, and she was missing for three months before he finally reported her missing because no one in her family had done so. It was even They were not even looking for her. 
Um, victim C is Megan Waterman. Megan Waterman, 22 years old, from Maine, um, had a boyfriend who was actually her pimp, and he began selling her on Backpage and Craigslist, and he would drive her from Maine to New York City, um, and they'd be gone for a week or two and then come back, her, her, her mother would say. she Basically, um, she Amber has a two-year-old daughter, Amber was a good mother. Her mother said, you know, she got caught up with the wrong guy and, you know, um, fell into a trap that a lot of girls fall into, you know, especially when that guy says he loves you and you fall in love and then now he wants you to sell your body to show your love. So anyway, um, Megan was last seen on 6-6-2010. In a at a Holiday Inn in Hot Bog, New York. Here's a strange thing, guys. Here's a strange thing, guys. Megan did the same thing Amber did, which was completely out of her character. Megan walked out of the hotel and down the main road, as far as the hotel cameras could see her. Um, and she left that room with nothing. She left the room with no cell phone, no I, nothing, no purse, no ID, no nothing that could say this is my who I am, um, which is something that again she had, had never done um, on those on dates, whatnot. Uh, as an as they learn things real quick as escorts, they tell each other tips to keep each other safe, and that. You know, always having a phone and whatnot on you is one of them. So, victim D was Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Maureen Brainerd Barnes from Norwich, Connecticut. Um, I don't have a lot on her except for that her um, her her family was. Or, excuse me, the local PD ignored family pleas to report her missing due to her going to New York to escort. Um, she also was a mother. She also um, has a sister and a mother who, you know, actively uh, are part of this case and, and want answers. So let's uh, keep going here. What is that? What? Not that far yet. All right, what's here? Now, I want to explain this to you because there's a total of 17 victims that were found at, in, during the search uh, of seven miles of beach. There was 10 in the area where the four girls were found. And that's, um, we're going to go through it. The four girls here. Then there was an unidentified Asian male who was dressed as a woman. Then here's Jessica Taylor, who was 20. Um, her hands and head were found on the beach where her torso was found miles away with this unidentified Jane Doe number six. Jane Doe number six um, was uh, put to rest right next to a toddler age girl who um, we thought, or they, the police thought was the child of maybe Jane Doe number six, but ended up being the child of an unidentified female found seven miles down the beach. And if you go down, they show uh, the rest of the victims that were found all the way up and down the beach. And then, of course, what I have not told you is that Shannon was eventually found. We're going to get to her in a minute. Let's go down here because it's oops, it's time to talk about what, what was found out about Shannon. Okay? Um, because Shannon wasn't found... Uh, where the girls were found that were suspected to be victims of the serial killer. Okay, um, let's see here. The Gilgo Beach Killer is the fourth fiend to sleep prostitutes on Long Island since 1989, so cops have been down this road before. They had a couple persons of interest, obviously, um, Let's see here. Collectively, well, I'm trying to find get you to the yeah. John Bitroff, the carpenter from Manorville, who was charged with strangling two prostitutes. They kind of looked at him at first, but they for some 
whatever happened, they, uh, what do you call it? They, they figured out that it wasn't him. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, um, then they also looked into a pair of NYPD cops who got in trouble for frequenting prostitutes. And James Bissett, James Bissett, a wealthy Long Island businessman who owned a nursery and killed himself in 2011. Rumors swirled about the motives for his suicide, but investigators say he's been crossed off the list of suspects. Cops also cleared Brewer, the client who hired Shannon the night she died. And heck, it was, oh, okay, this is the thing. I want to tell you really quick how, where Shannon was. Shannon was found seven miles down this beach. But the thing that they're not, they, you can't see from here or on this thing, is that Shannon was found, her clothes and shoes, or excuse me, her pants and shoes, her whole bottom half, of clothes and shoes, were found in one area. Shannon was found a mile and a half further down. Yet they claim she was not a victim of the serial killer, that she died of strangulation, and that her clothes came off in the brush. But yet she kept going another mile and a half with no shoes and no clothes on and that thick, that thick brush poison ivy stuff. So there's a lot of questions about why they wouldn't, you know, include shannon gilbert's case in the, the serial killer and with the you know and say that she was a, a victim of the same thing that the other people had been a victim of um anyway it says it's been four years and they've got not got too much to show for it um and it says suffolk county cops will say nothing and that's a big thing the families keep saying you know we keep calling we're begging why haven't you given us any updates and they just basically blow them off completely the department is not commenting at this time they'll say you know so on and so forth being left in the dark has infuriated some of the families all they say is that when they find the killer i'll be the first to know says marie ducharme the mother of victim marine brainer barnes they're lying they're saying that to keep me satisfied ducharme slammed the police for how they've conducted their probe which has been plagued by unfound rumors misinformation public specs among among officials flip-flopping theory theories and probers facilitating between there being one or two murderers it's one police say now if they had done a good job, they would have found the killer already. And yeah. And then it says, within days of unearthing oops, Bartholomew's remains, police found the bodies of three uh, yeah, three more call girls. It's always, I can't just say three more young women. Um, so that's another thing is... Um, the toddler child, that's a big, you know, to kill a toddler child, you know, to, to kill a child is so infuriating. But to, all these women, are, some of these girls are still children themselves. Now, in 2013, the remains of 31-year-old Natasha Jugo washed up onto a Gilgo beach, June 2013. Said, the cops are still studying her case to determine whether it's a, whether it's in connection with the others. It says NYPD did their best to pinpoint the calls to the crowded areas of Midtown Manhattan of when the guy was calling the sister threatening to kill her with the, with the dead girl's phone. So they, it says right here they tried to... Uh, pinpoint the calls, but they just couldn't find them. They also believe the killer turned on the phone once in Massapequa, a town just 10 miles from Gilgo. So, as let's get back to where it was, because here we go. Cops cleared Brewer, the client who hired Shannon on the night she died, and Hackett, which is this Peter Hackett, is a doctor who inserted himself in this case by calling Shannon's mother and, and saying, you know, um, first saying that he knew Shannon and he wanted to help her find Shannon and all these things. Oops. 
and ended up, he, he told her that he ran a wayward home for girls, and somehow, somehow, something came out about him medicating Shannon that night. But he denies it all once he was confronted by a news crew, he got a lawyer, he clamped down, but he's been cleared as well. <laughs> In Hackett, the neighbor whom Marie Gilbert turned away, her distraught daughter, but not before drugging her. Oh, yeah, he said he turned her away after he drugged her, drugged her and told her to get out. Brewer admits he hired Gilbert, who was in his house for three hours, but claimed the two never had sex. She fled his home in paranoid terror after taking large quantities of drugs. Hackett claims he gave Gilbert a medicine to calm her down and tried to reach her family to get help, but no one came and she ran off. Brewer continued to live under a cloud, a self-published Roman what up, Confessions of the Oak Beach, uh, suspicions on character Damon Brooks, who bears a strong resemblance to Brewer. The Brooks character beats up a prostitute. Okay, so who really is the Gilgo Beach killer, and will the police ever catch him? The best chance so far may have come to Times Square, not Long, not Long Island, soon after Bartholomew vanished in 2009. That's, and that's the phone call thing. That's the guy. Um, when That's when NYPD, working with Lynn, triangulated one of the killer's calls to the tourist. I rushed in, dashing into porn shops and other locations in a frantic bid to nail him. But he never stayed on the phone for more than three minutes, and soon he stopped calling. That's terrible. Now, in Megan Waterman's case, some more, some other stuff happened. There was an arrest of the pimp. Um, Akeem Malik Cruz went to prison for taking Megan Waterman to New York to prostitute her on the weekend she disappeared, which I think is. This right here is all credit to Megan Waterman's mother and supporters for making sure that the man who got her into that life and that did not protect her that night um, is the one that it bears some, at least some responsibility for her being in that ground. Um, it basically goes on. Oh, there's Megan right there. Now that I found out who I am, personal feelings have got involved. Cruz told the judge, I've served the time for the decisions I've made. I'm not the same person anymore. Cruz pleaded guilty to interstate pimping and a federal charge in New York in 2013 connection with Waterman and got a three-year sentence. After his release on probation, a warrant was issued for his arrest in, oops, his arrest in September for failure to appear in New York on allegations he violated his, the terms of his probation. Cruz was animated in court, speaking out, though he was reminded by the judge of his right to remain silent. Cruz and Kelly asked Kelly to remove Elam from the new case, but Kelly denied his, his request. Um, there's like a lot of stuff here. I think we can be sure he's coming back to Maine because he has Maggie Lamb on the case. Attorney E. Lamb is on Mr. Cruz like white on rice. He's, it says, Kelly said Cruz's bail at 500 cash with conditions that he not be in a vehicle with any unrelated females that, he, that he's not to be in a hotel or motel or any other transient facility with any unrelated females. And as of Wednesday evening, Cruz had not made bail. If he does, he will remain. Or, or yeah, if he, so, if he does, he will remain in federal custody. Okay. Um. This is the funeral for um Shannon Gilbert. There's Shannon's mom in the front, Marie, and there's Shannon's sisters, Sarah and Sherry. And then this is Shannon, the lawyer um, who's representing this case, uh, the case um, for the mother. 
I can't. I'll tell you his name in a minute. I can't think. Um, let's see. I don't see it. They don't put like a name, list of names up there. But anyway, I know that. Um, we're going to get into it. You'll see. There's some things that everybody's life was affected by this guy's. Everyone, the victims' families were victimized over and over again by this, the, by the police department, by the feds, by just, yeah. Chilling finds links ally dumping grounds. What? Sorry, I'm just reading the guy that went up. All right, here we go. So what happened in this case? Well, gruesome details. Mental illness defense. Opening trial of the Ellenville woman who killed her mother. Shannon's younger sister, Sarah, had mental health problems as well. And after years of trying to find her sister's killer, um... She had lost custody of her son uh, recently for trying to drown or for drowning her pit bull puppy. Um, and while on out on bail or probation or whatnot for that, um, she had got her mother to come over to the house alone without her boyfriend and all that. She knew how to con her mom. She knew exactly what to say to Connor. And Sarah Gilbert ended up. Stabbing her, hang on, stabbing her mother 227 times, you guys. That's insane. Beat her with a fire extinguisher and tried to drown her with the foam. Ultimately attempted to decapitate her all because she thought she was an evil god. Um, the lawyer who represented the mother in the Shan in Shannon's case, uh, yeah, Ray, is also now represent representing Sarah in her murder case. Um, and of course, that's all been finished now. They did not let her mental illness stuff change their minds. They ended up sentencing her to twenty five to life. Oops. Sarah Gilbert is sentenced to 25 years to life in prison in the stabbing death of mother. And this lawyer even says she's going to kill somebody in prison. He says she will kill somebody in there. There's no doubt in his mind that she will kill somebody in prison. And it's sad because, you know, this was a girl who maybe if her sister hadn't been you know, found dead and brutalized, that she would still be here today as well as the mother. So this is the next thing. Let's see. Oh, we're on. Um, I'll take a couple of these down. That way I can get maybe play a video in a minute. But, um, yeah, I started looking into these girls individually, the lives they had before that. All, and it's just very strange how there's still no, I mean, the, the, it wasn't like they were hidden miles back in. They were 35 feet from the road. There's got to be more information out there than, and that's why I believe the, the officer has something to do with it. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot of things here that happened other than just a girl trying to kill her mother. Um, I'm almost there, guys. Sorry. Let me just get this done. There's other people who had other situations as well. Okay, let's try that. 
the strange rise and fall of the Long Island's dirtiest police chief. Um, it says... Sorry. It says, um, and the former Suffolk County police chief, James Burks. And then James Burke was um, the police chief, and Dorman was the commissioner at the time. And they just, everything they did seemed like it had its own agenda. Um, former Suffolk County Chief James Burke recent conviction of civil rights charges opened a window into a lurid cop culture of illegal wiretapping, co cover-ups, sex addiction, drunk driving, and blackmail. And on December 14th, 2012, cops arrest 26-year-old a 26-year-old named Christopher Loeb outside his mother's house in New York, slammed his thin body to the ground, started roughing him up, and when his mother Jane arrived, the uh, the officers relented and drove oh, sorry, yeah, when his mother Jane arrived, the officers relented and drove him to the Suffolk County Police Department, 4th Precinct in nearby Hapog, where they chained him to a floor. Loeb was kept in the dark about his arrest and denied access to a lawyer. Oops. But it soon dawned on him that the treatment that the treatment might have been, have something to do with a black duffel bag he'd recently stolen from the back seat of an unlocked black 2008 GMC Yukon. Right. Yeah. A heroin user who dabbled in a burg in burglary to support his habit, Loeb had found things in the bag that might have belonged to a police officer, handcuffs, mace, and a gun. But he also found things that pointed to something much darker, um, like porn that appeared to him to be prepubescent boys. And according to court documents, James Burke, the then police chief of Suffolk County, derived pleasure from presiding over the continued abuse of Loeb at the police station. He told his officer, fellow officers of, with an air of wistfulness later on that, that it reminded him was, of his old days coming up in the force. He jokingly called the cops who he aided who aided him in subduing Loeb, his palace guards. Oops. Wow. And then one of these men allegedly told Loeb he was going to rape his mother during the beating. Oops. Wow. Burke even threatened to murder Loeb with a hot shot or a fatal overdose of heroin that might later be arranged to appear self-inflicted. Of all things, you could tell this man. Wow. So, hang on here. And then it says, I'm immobilized but conscious of the fact that Burke was the owner of the bag with the alleged porn stash Loeb called the chief a name. Newspapers typically soften the word to pervert. And the feds say Loeb was mistaken. But in Loeb's telling of the story, a document in the video... In a video interview recorded for Newsday, he called Burke a pedophile. According to Loeb, when the chief heard that word, he exploded with rage, driving his thick fingers into the young man's face. And then it says here that uh, he used to tell people that he wanted to become a cop so he could get away with breaking the law. And that's on Richard, or excuse me, John, James Burke. It's done. Um, it goes into everything that happened, but, um, basically the dirty cop that was overseeing this Long Island serial killer's case just got busted doing his own dirt, just kind of like that, you know what I mean? Alright, hold on here. He's, okay, yeah, here he is. He's sentenced to 46 months here. So he did get found guilty from the whole Lo Christopher Loeb situation and was sentenced to, um, yeah, was it? I'm trying to think of a lunch. Yeah, for, he'll do all 46 as fed time. So, yeah, he's going to do all 46 months. I don't think you get parole time when it's a fed case. You get, all right, so... 
We'll keep going now. You see, he got for that whole case that, that he was in uh, writing up about that boy that wasn't true. They found that and they started looking to, uh, into other people that he had cases out against. And they found like seven, not uh, seven cases that were um, compromised because of. The kid, you know, the, the things that he was into. But guess who else was involved? There's always someone higher up. DA at the center of the Long Island serial killer investigation charged in dirty cop cover up. Suffolk County District Attorney. Thomas Spada has been indicted, indicted for the obstruction of justice after federal probe into an alleged cover-up of practice brutality. What the heck? Oh, police brutality and committed by former Suffolk County Police Chief, a longtime friend of the district attorney. Spotted announced earlier this week he would not be seeking re-election. Oh, okay, it says that. It says that this just talks about he be, him beating up Christopher Lowe, but it doesn't talk about anything else. Oh, witness uh, and obstruction of obstructing an investigation. Witness tampering and obstructing an investigation. Oh gosh. All right, hang on. I want to show you guys something real quick because we're almost to the end of this, and I really want you guys to see um, everyone for who they are, not for this escort prostitute thing they like to slap next to their names. These are of Megan and Shannon, and I have another one that I'm gonna. This, that's why it says part one. I have a part, oops, I have a part two that when I do the next video uh, for these girls, the uh, I have a part two for other ones. I just wasn't finished with it in time to put it in this video. Um, the next thing I want to show you guys quickly is when I started my channel about six months ago, um, um, when I was live streaming for the Kanika Jenkins case, many people wanted me to monetize and I wouldn't. Um, and I normally wouldn't even have thought about it. It was not an option. However, 
I have decided to commit to doing this full time. Um, I am trying to build a channel. I have two channels going, but I, right now I'm trying to build my channel up so that this can be a career that I can have from home. Um, as you know, I have Crohn's and so having a career outside of the home is nearly impossible. Um, so, and I don't, I'm not, I didn't ever apply for disability. It's a long, it's a long thing. Sorry with me. I was a nurse for eight years, so I don't want to ever have the name disabled and not be able to work again if somehow I miraculously am healed. <laughs> However, I'm going to ask everyone to do me a favor. If you like what I do, if you appreciate the information I bring you, if you want me to be able to do this full time and you are committed to, I mean, there's lots of you that have said, you know, Kate, your hard work is worth something. Well, it's time to <laughs> put your money where your mouth is. Um, my, my Patreon channel is, or my Patreon page is up. It's patreon.com uh, backslash Kate420. Um, you can go to it now and become a patron. Um, I've set a couple of goals. I haven't put any, uh, uh, I haven't even got the chance to put up anything on there. <laughs> I just put, I just launched my campaign. You can go see my, my Patreon uh, video or whatnot. And pretty soon, uh, the goal, first goal is the first $500 I make, I'm going to start a, a special YouTube live series where I interview one patron every month um, on live stream, which I think that'll be cool. And I'm also going to have special material that is only for patrons that'll be posted on here um, for only patrons to see. So if you're interested you know where it's at now. Um, I'm still figuring out how to put the link in my description box because of the um, video recording source I use. Uh, it doesn't allow me to, to there is no description box on the video uh, screen sharing thing that I use. So once I figure out how to, I might have to go back into my YouTube and do it. But for now, please, you know, if, if you're interested, pass it on patreon.com bat slash kate420 become a patron and let's make this a permanent thing let's you know become part of the everyday discussion that's going on out there let's keep names alive of people who once were getting calls for justice but are no longer uh no one's any longer saying their name you know that happens every time there's a tragedy. It's justice, justice, justice until the next tragedy. And then those people's names no longer are heard. So with that being said, um, justice for Shannon Gilbert, Megan Waterman, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Um, it should be Melissa. I'm sorry. I don't know why it came out there. It's M Melissa about... Beth, uh, Melissa Beth, 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 Oh my God. <laughs> Amber Costello and Jessica Taylor, as well as the other victims that have not been identified. Uh, this is K420, y'all coming at you. I'm going to try to get back into the live stream things this week. Um, I, now that I got my Patreon up and going, I've got lots of work to do. So uh, if you want to help me make this full time, I look forward to it. Everybody, uh, I will see you in the next video.